Hello and welcome to Freya's Tropical Garden. We've had some lovely weather over the last few weeks and we've even had some beautiful days of sunshine. Things have started growing again, but of course at this time of year nothing lasts forever and last night we have had some more frost again, but that's to be expected at this time of year. And we're not truly out of the woods until at least May. Now here's what we've got coming up for you on today's show. I visit Wisley for inspiration on hardy evergreen plants. I discuss the problem of fungus gnats and how to get rid of them. And there's another chance to watch this video from last season. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody for leaving comments on my channel. It's great to have your feedback and I'm sharing some of those with you now. But I'd also like to say a special thank you to Garden Enthusiast, who's used the Super Thanks feature to donate £5 towards my channel. That's really appreciated. Thank you so much. If you'd like to make a donation to support with future projects that this channel got planned, there are two ways that you can do that. First of all, you can make a one-off donation through the Super Thanks feature. Or if you'd like to make a regular contribution, you can join for a membership. There are three memberships available and all three of them will give you an entry into a monthly competition to win a plant in my garden. Now, first up, let's take a look at how my garden's been doing over the last three weeks. Although a lot of my garden's looking very brown at the moment, this back stretch here is probably the bit that's looking the best. I've got quite a lot of evergreen plants growing along the back and in addition to that some of them are flowering at the moment such as the camellias and the mimosa tree which is giving a lovely splash of colour at the back here at the moment. Although we have a few grey days there's also been some lovely sunshine as well and so far February's been so mild that we've actually got quite a lot of new growth coming through at the moment such as this persicaria red dragon. Of course, once we get another cold spell and some more frosts, it will die back down to ground level again, and that won't do the plant any harm. I've also got some canna that's trying to emerge at the moment. The canna patterns and the canna cleopatra are both sending up some new shoots. And there are new leaves coming out on my musabazju bananas. Of course, it's unlikely that this growth will continue for long, but while it does, it does remind you that spring is round the corner. My Sambucus was sulking a bit last year after I moved it, but I've got new growth coming through now. And there are buds appearing on my Asa Palmatum shrub as well. This voodoo lily, Dracunculus vulgaris, is always one of the first to emerge in the year. Much earlier than the other types of voodoo lily that I grow, such as the Soramatum. It also dies back to ground level quite early on in the year in comparison to other plants, so it's always a relief when I see it's grown back and it's still alive. And in my last video three weeks ago, I showed you that my arum lily had finally died back, although not all the way to ground level. And as you can see, these leaves are coming back again quite quickly. In fact, I think this has been the longest year that the arum lily has had foliage since I've been growing them. Two weeks ago, I filmed my gunnera starting to produce new leaves, again thinking that this wouldn't last long, but now two weeks later, you can see that they really are growing quite well, although the leaves are a little browned by frost. Two weeks ago, my white camellia was flowering beautifully and looks absolutely stunning. Camellias are great at a tropical garden, not just for their evergreen foliage, but also their early flowers. And although the flowers don't last long and you can see that they are starting to brown a bit now, it certainly hasn't finished flowering and you can see that there are still more buds waiting to come through. Plus my red camellia is also just starting to flower as well. Although I've only got a couple of flowers on it at the moment, there are plenty of buds waiting to open up. And my red camellia always flowers just after my white camellia, which helps to keep those flowers and colour in my garden going for that little bit longer. And that always gives me something to look forward to at this time of year as well. Camellias originate from Asia, so although a lot of them will grow really well in our climate, they are still considered a tropical plant. And my mimosa tree, Acacia dilbata, is flowering with these beautiful yellow puffball flowers. Acacia are hardy in the milder areas of the UK, although it will struggle to grow in the cooler areas. Last year, the harsh frosts nearly killed my acacia and it hardly produced any flowers. However, it recovered well and this year it's been absolutely fine and now I'm really starting to see it at its best. And I've got several tulips coming up around the garden now. 
These are tulips that I grew last year, which are coming back again. And I have planted more tulips this year as well. So there should be plenty of colour soon. And some of the crocuses are starting to flower in my lasagna planting. You may remember my earlier video when I planted this up, but if you haven't seen it, there's a link to it in my description. Cornus sanguinea often looks stunning in winter due to its vibrant red wood colour. However, the older wood turns brown, so I'm just going to coppice this by sawing it right at the bottom. By taking away all of these branches, the new growth should come through with that lovely vibrant red colour. So next winter we'll really see the benefits of that, but for now it looks a little bit more sparse in that area. But I have got some new plants which I planted in the bed that I created last year. I'll be providing more information about this gecko gold later in the video. And Grevillea victoria you may remember from my video on Trabar. This hardy evergreen plant will look spectacular when it grows bigger with beautiful orange flowers. And it flowers from late autumn through to early spring, so in future my winter garden may look much more colourful. And next to it I've planted my first locat tree, Eriobotria deflexa. Inside the house my Amaryllis carmen is now flowering. This is the third of my Amaryllis bulbs that I bought, which has flowered. And I've shown you the other two on my previous two episodes. So if you've missed those, then check those out. And I've been experimenting with a different propagation method for cuttings. Although Tradescantia is a very easy plant to propagate anyway, I decided to have a go with this plastic bag and just inserting the cuttings through holes that I made with a skewer. By tying up the bag, it contained the damp soil inside so it didn't dry out. I haven't needed to water it at all and the cuttings have all rooted really well. Although one interesting side effect from growing the cuttings this way is that I've inadvertently grown a few extra plants as well. You see, when I filled up this bag of compost, I just reused some old soil. For instance, growing here is Alocasia plumbea metallica, and I had moved the parent plant into Lecca, which is another growing medium that I'll be talking about in another video in future but there must have been some rhizome left in it. So now I've got two new plants where originally I was actually struggling to grow the parent plant and hence the move to Lecca where it's actually doing very well now. And somehow a little spider plant has also got in. But I will just point out that the downside of propagating in this method is the mess. And I've been a bit late starting my chilli seeds this year, but I finally sown seven varieties. So it's a lot more scaled down than last year. But so far I've already got germinations of Caramel Nagler Beast, which is a super hot variety. Thor's Thunderbolt, which has grown because it's a very attractive twisty chilli. Pink Tiger, which I've always struggled to germinate each year and germinated last year for the first time. And other seeds that I've germinated include this Eucomis African Breeze. The Ginger Hedicium Foristiae. One of my favourite plants, Dazillerian Wheelery. A new variety of yucca for me, called Yucca Regida. Physalis alcacenji is the Chinese lantern plant, and Hibiscus coccinius, which will have a beautiful red flower. Last year I reviewed the Extreme 20 aeroponic propagator, and now I've bought the Extreme 40 aeroponic propagator, which is the larger size. So you can see I'm now being able to produce a lot more cuttings. So hopefully we'll have a few more plants for sale this year. Now, I've had lots of people ask me, what's a good, hardy, evergreen plant that can grow in your garden to give it a tropical look through winter? So I've gone on a fact-finding mission to RHS Wisley to have a look at how their exotic garden looks in winter and to bring you some information about some of the plants that they've got growing there. Winter may not be the most obvious time of year for visiting tropical or subtropical gardens. Many of the plants will have died back to ground level or would have been wrapped or moved to protect them from the harsher frosts. In fact, looking at the sparse, bare patches of soil reminds me a lot of how my garden looks at the moment. However, 
I am currently looking for more ideas for plants that will still look good in winter. Evergreen, hardy plants that can help give my garden that tropical feel, even on the coldest days of the year. And what better way to get inspiration than to visit local tropical gardens and see what plants they can leave outside near you. So I'm here in Wisley to talk you through every plant that is still growing outdoors in Wisley's exotic garden. Acaceloiana is also known as the pineapple guava. This is an evergreen shrub with grey-green leaves. In summer, it produces red and white flowers. It can grow up to 2.5 metres in height. It prefers full sun and is hardy in the milder areas of the UK. Fasicularia bicolor is also known as Rhodostachys bicolor or the crimson bromeliad. Fasicularia bicolor is a rosette forming bromeliad with slender spiny toothed evergreen leaves. In summer, Newer leaves in the centre are striking bright red in colour. It prefers full sun and is hardy in milder areas of the UK. Nandina domestica sunset is commonly known as the chopstick plant. It's a compact evergreen shrub which typically grows to around four to six foot in height. New growth is vibrant reddish colour, fading to purple and then green. It's hardy down to minus 15 degrees and prefers full sun and a sheltered position. Trochodendron aralioides is also known as the wheel tree. Although it may grow to 10 metres in the wild, it is a slow-growing shrub, typically growing to 3 metres. It has aromatic bark and evergreen leaves up to 12 centimetres long. It grows well in full sun or partial shade and is hardy in milder areas of the UK. Schefflera rhododendrophodia is a hardy umbrella tree native to the Himalayas. It can grow up to 10 metres tall, and in summer produces clusters of small white flowers. It grows well in full sun or partial shade in a sheltered spot, and is hardy in most of the UK. Schefflera taiwaniana is a much sought-after plant. Its glossy dark green leaves look very exotic, while new growth looks like silvery fountains. It prefers full sun and shelter from strong winds and is hardy down to minus 10 degrees. Mahonia softcaress is an upright evergreen compact shrub growing to 1.2 metres in height. Unlike other Mahonia varieties, softcaress is spine free. But like other varieties, it produces beautiful yellow flowers in summer and autumn. It grows well in full sun or partial shade and is hardy in most of the UK. Fatsia japonica variegata is a really beautiful form of the popular Fatsia japonica, with deep glossy leaves randomly variegated with cream or white. It grows best in shade or part shade and is hardy in most of the UK. Fatsia polycarpa is also known as green fingers due to the deeply lobed leaves. It can grow up to two metres tall and originates from the shady hills of Taiwan. It's best grown in partial shade and is hardy in most of the UK. Podocarpus macrophyllus is a conifer native to southern Japan. In the UK, it grows to about 15 foot and it's slow growing. It grows well in full sun, but will remain greener if grown in light shade, and it's hardy through most of the UK. Pseudopanax gecko gold is an attractive variegated glossy-leaved plant with palmate irregularly toothed leaflets. It can grow up to two metres tall and is hardy in the milder parts of the UK or in cooler areas with a good sheltered spot. They grow best in full sun or dappled shade. Cyadopides verticillida is also known as the umbrella pine. It's a slow-growing evergreen conifer that grows up to 20 metres in height. It's native to Japan 
and grows best in full sun or partial shade in a sheltered spot and is hardy down to minus 20 degrees C. Cryptomeria japonica araucarioides is native to Japan, where they are revered as the national tree. It is a highly unusual and architectural tree, with its long branches resembling rope. It prefers full sun or partial shade and is hardy throughout the UK. Bletchnum chilens is also known as the Chilean hard fern and it's one of the most spectacular evergreen ferns available which is suited to UK gardens. It can reach 1.5 metres in height and prefers full or partial shade and it's hardy in most of the UK. Stauntonia hexaphylla or the Stauntonia vine is endemic to Japan. It's a vigorous climber which produces pink flowers in spring. It prefers full sun or partial shade and is hardy in the milder areas of the UK. Eucalyptus pulvigulenta is commonly known as the silver-leaved mountain gum. Endemic to New South Wales, this is a slow-growing, compact, evergreen tree with intense silver-blue foliage. It grows best in full sun and is hardy in most of the UK. Euphorbia roundway titan is an erect, robust, evergreen shrub that can grow up to one metre tall. The yellow-green foliage can often produce vivid red tones in autumn and winter. It prefers full sun, is drought-resistant and hardy throughout the UK. Magnolia figo is an evergreen shrub that grows three to four metres tall. It's native to China and sometimes called the Chinese banana tree. It flowers from late spring to early summer. It's hardy in milder areas of the UK and will grow best in full sun or partial shade. Magnolia grandiflora Bracken's Brown Beauty is a large evergreen tree with leathery, ovate, glossy dark green leaves with a rusty brown underside and large flagrant white flowers in summer and autumn. It prefers full sun and is hardy down to around minus 27 degrees C, once fully established. Magnolia grandiflora Mont Blanc is very similar to the Bracken's Brown Beauty, with bronzed underside of each leaf giving a stunning hue. It prefers full sun or part shade, and is hardy throughout most of the UK. Area Botria japonica Roseanne is also known as the Locat tree. Roseanne has larger than average leaves and is more disease resistant and hardier than other varieties. It prefers full sun and may grow up to 5 metres in 20 years. It's hardy in most of the UK. Raphiobotria copertone is a cross between Eriobotria and Raphiolepsis. Glossy evergreen leaves contrast with an attractive red new growth and pink flowers in early summer. It prefers full sun and is hardy in milder areas of the UK. Pinus patula is also known as the Mexican weeping pine. It's an evergreen conifer with slender, drooping, bright green needles up to 30 centimetres in length. It can grow to 12 metres tall and prefers full sun in a sheltered spot. It's drought-tolerant and hardy in most of the UK. Pinus Sheffield Park is a very rare, medium-to-large coniferous tree with greyish-green needles resembling a chimney-sweeper's brush. It prefers full sun and is hardy in most of the UK. It was brought back from the brink of extinction by Limecross Nursery, where at the time of filming this, purchasing one will set you back £4,000. Butia odorata is also known as the jelly palm. Originating from Brazil and Uruguay, Butias are tolerant of both heavy frosts and wet winters. They also tend to grow faster than many other palms. They grow best in full or part sun and in milder areas of the UK. Trachycarpus latisectus is an attractive palm tree only now growing wild in the Himalayas. It's hardy down to about minus 7 degrees, but may need extra protection while young 
and temperatures below minus 6 degrees may cause leaf burn. Trachycarpus urcarulensis is a variety of palm tree native to Urcarul in the Himalayas. It has stiff blue silver leaves on the underside and is hardy down to around minus 7 degrees C. Camerops humilis is also known as the Mediterranean fan palm. It's an extremely tough palm clustering to form an attractive bushy appearance. Once established, it is drought tolerant and grows well in full sun or part shade and is hardy in most of the UK. Camerops humilis volcano is a compact bushy palm growing to around 2 metres tall. Leaves have silvery underside and it grows best in full sun or partial shade in a sheltered spot. This palm is hardy through most of the UK. Trachycarpus nagi is a cross between Trachycarpus wagnerinus and Trachycarpus nanus. Although there can be variation in hybrids, both parent plants are hardy in the UK, making it quite likely that the nagi will also be relatively robust. Butia eriospatha is a small species of Butia endemic to Brazil. It's similar to Butia odorata, but is distinguished by its rust-coloured woolly hairs, which give it its nickname, the woolly jelly palm. It's hardy in milder areas of the UK. Rapidophyllum hysterix is also known as the needle palm. It's native to the southeast of the USA and is a clump-forming palm, with several stems coming from a single stem and growing no taller than 1.5 metres. It can grow in full sun through to full shade and is drought-resistant and hardy throughout the UK. Jubea chilensis is also known as the Chilean wine palm. It's one of the most hardy palm trees grown in the UK, but is still relatively hard to get hold of due to its slow-growing nature. Trachycarpus wagneranus is often called the waggy. It's a variety of Trachycarpus which is more wind-resistant than Trachycarpus fortunii due to its stiffer leaves. It's hardy in most of the UK and is an easy, trouble-free plant. Trachycarpus fortunii variegata is a variegated form of the more commonly known Trachycarpus fortunii. Now, I nearly missed this plant as I was walking around Wisley, as I mistook the variegation for the sunlight passing through the leaves. I think you'll agree it's an absolutely stunning variety, and care tips are very similar for the hardy Trachycarpus fortunii. Now, a common problem a lot of tropical gardeners have at this time of year when we're moving our plants indoors to overwinter them is fungus gnats. And this next video will tell you a little bit more about them and how to deal with them. Fungus gnats are small greyish brown or black flies around three to four millimetres long that infest soil and potting mix. They can often be seen running over the surface of seed trays or pots, or flying slowly around plants. Fungus nuts don't bite or spread diseases in humans, but can cause yellowing and stunted growth in plants. Their larvae predominantly feeds on fungi and organic matter in the soil, making them part of a balanced ecosystem. However, they can also eat roots, which particularly causes problems for young plants and seedlings. Outdoors, fungus gnats are unlikely to be problematic to gardeners. However, inside the home, particularly if you keep a lot of house plants or bring plants indoors for winter, without natural predators they can breed quickly. The presence of fungus gnats is often an indication of overwatering, as they prefer to lay their eggs in damp soil, and therefore it can help to let the top one or two inches dry out between waterings or add a layer of sand or grit to the top of your soil around the plants to make the soil less accessible. Most fungus gnats live in the soil as larva or pupa, emerging as an adult fly which can live for seven days and lay around 200 eggs. So how can you tell if you've got a fungus gnat infestation? In all likeliness, the first sign is that you'll see these little flies crawling all over your soil.
and flying around your plants. However, if you still got any doubt as to whether it's a fungus gnat infestation or perhaps it's fruit flies, then there are some things you can do to be sure. If you take a close look at the surface of your soil, you might see the small white larvae wriggling around. Although unless your eyesight's very good, then it would probably help to get a camera and zoom in on the soil level so that you can see it a little bit more clearly. Another technique you can use if you've got an old potato lying around the house is to cut it up into slices. And you can use these slices to attract the larvae up to the surface of the soil. So place your slices of potato into your pots and leave it there for about three days. You may see some larvae on the potatoes or you may even just see these little white eggs that have been laid on the potato slice. Just to give you an idea how small they are, I've shown this wood louse climbing around next to them. So how do you get rid of the adults and the larvae? Well, by far the best way to get rid of the adult flies is to use sticky yellow traps. These could be purchased cheaply on Amazon or in garden centres, and within minutes you'll find you've started to collect flies on it. The traps are not toxic, they're not harmful to pets or wildlife, but they will collect these flies, and the flies will get stuck on the trap and be unable to move, a little bit like being caught in a spider's web. Or you can make a DIY trap with water and apple cider vinegar in equal parts and mixing it in a shallow container with a few drops of dish soap. You can also make a flying insect killer out of peppermint, cinnamon and sesame oil, which is non-toxic. Or of course you can use commercial fly sprays. My personal preference is the yellow sticky traps because as you can see here it is a very effective way of capturing the adult flies. However, if you've got a larger infestation, you'll probably have to buy a lot of these traps and you should also tackle the root problem of the larvae in the soil. One of the best ways to do that is with a 3% hydrogen peroxide solution, which can be purchased again online in shops like Amazon or in chemists. Simply measure out one part of hydrogen peroxide to four parts of water and apply that to the soil. This will not harm your plants in any way, but it will kill off all of the larvae and eggs that are living in the soil. Another method which works well for the larvae in the soil is to buy nematodes. Nematodes are microscopic eelworms that live in the soil and will destroy all the eggs and larvae in the soil. They're also really good for killing things like slugs and vine weevils. They're not harmful to humans and again they can be purchased online. Next up, there's another opportunity to watch my video on how to tell if your palm tree is dead. After the winter that we've just had, there's probably quite a few of you who are wondering how to tell whether your palm trees are still alive. So I'm just going to demonstrate for you using two of the palm trees that I've got growing in my garden. Although this Washingtonia has gone very brown, you can see it's still green here at the base. And if I give that central new leaf that's emerging a good tug, it is not moving. This smaller Washingtonia, however, has gone completely brown. And when I tried pulling the central leaf, it came out easily. Now, I've never tried this before, but I have heard that all might not be lost if you use fungicide. So I'm spraying this liberally inside the centre of the palm tree. And this should help stop the dead material from rotting further. If you want to know whether this works, then please subscribe to my channel. Well, that's all we've got time for today. I hope you've enjoyed watching Freya's Tropical Garden and see you again next time. If you're enjoying the content of Freya's Tropical Garden, then please help this channel grow by subscribing. Every new subscriber is appreciated. And by turning on notifications to my videos, you can also make sure that you don't miss any episodes in future. You can also follow me on social media where I'll release links to my latest videos as well as share my flower of the day. You can follow me on X, Instagram, Threads, Facebook or join my Facebook group to engage in discussions and share your own photos. Freya's Tropical Garden webpage also has links to my videos and helpful advice. And now in order to support the continued growth of this channel there is an option of becoming a member which will give you access to a private Facebook group 
where I'll be running monthly competitions exclusively for members, as well as additional exclusive content. And as always, I welcome your feedback in the comments below.